Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast presented exclusively on the Chop Sports channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this on Thursday, May 11th. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, Manchester United feel the heat from Liverpool. Arsenal face another must-win. And we say goodbye to the last man standing of the greatest midfield of all time. But first, Manchester City versus Real Madrid. How did I feel? What did it do? And how did I survive? But before we get to that, please like, share, subscribe the show. Like, share, subscribe the show. Like, share, subscribe the show. And we'll get into it right after this. We're going to talk Real Madrid, Manchester City, 1-1 in the Champions League. How did I feel? How did it feel? It felt fucking stressful. (laughs) These games are too big to be normal. They're too big to feel anything normal. Um, They're too big for anyone to kind of understand. And I think these games take on different meaning for different folks. Uh, I know that there are people that hate Real Madrid because they're the biggest team and they win everything. And there are people that hate Manchester City because we're Manchester City. So there's a giant rock in a hard place um, level. However... If you come at it from a neutral perspective, if you come at it from a lover of football, if you come at it from just wanting to see high-level stuff, there was nothing better than this game. Uh, I'm so used to seeing City dominate whoever they play that seeing them play an equal, for lack of a better word, was unusual. I was offset. I was sort of pushed back. And in the first 25 minutes, it felt like Real Madrid were giving City a bit of a -a rope-a-dope, the famous... um, Muhammad Ali tactic to let George Foreman punch his arms out. City had the ball. We're moving around. Everything's good. Everything's fine. It feels like we have chances. Holland scuffs a couple shots. It's like, oh, oh, where are these goals going to go in? Is it just a matter of time? Not so fast with Real Madrid. They are better than you expect them to be. And I shouldn't have been so naive as to not think about that. Now, to be fair, a lot of this game, there was nothing going on. First 20 minutes, like I th- like I said, City were on top. Uh, took five shots, none of them very good, uh, aside from the Rodri one that uh, Courtois made the save. And again, Courtois, the guy is a giant fucking space pelican who has the arms of an octopus, and he's gigantic. Uh, that shot that Rodri took would have gone in against 95% of goalkeepers, but against... Courtois, not so fast. So um, everything's fine. Then I believe this to be true, but there's a moment that Ilkay Gundogan gets bumped. He knocks his head on the floor. He kicks an elbow or whatever. And there's a stoppage in play at about the 25-minute mark. And at that point, there seems to be a change after that. Um Real Madrid just get a bit more into the game. There's a bit more control. There's a bit more fight. There's a bit more of something. Uh, And it's in that moment that Bernardo, after it restarts, Bernardo's on the far uh, side playing with the ball. He loses it on a back pass. Camavinga gets a hold of it and runs three quarters down the field. It's an incredible, sorry, that's not accurate. He wins the ball, passes it to Modric, who, of course, in Modric style, I mean, just what an incredible player. He just touches it around the corner back to Kamavinga, who then runs down the field, not being fouled because everyone's men marking each other in City are just trying to squeeze the life out of Real. So if someone takes a run and just runs past you, the man who's marking you goes with you. So Bernardo's behind Kamavinga the whole way. Uh, He can't really uh, get a hold of him. And there's a give and go between he and Vinicius Jr. And Vinny just pops in in the top bins. A laser beam, a laser strike. Uh, The Bernabeu goes nuts. And I am sunk. Uh, It's against the run of play. I'm just like, what the fuck just happened? But Real Madrid do this. This is what they do. They are the best at capitalizing on the moments. Because to be a Real Madrid, to be a Madrista, is to not be afraid. Is to believe. Is to... By nature of the cert, you have confidence. And if you don't, you don't play. 
So there's no lack of confidence that lives within Real Madrid. No player who's lacking confidence can play for Real Madrid because by nature of the fact that you are on Real Madrid, you are by nature confident. <laughs> so they're there. Um, and Vinny Jr. does put it in and we ring the second half. There's a lot of chippiness going on. Uh, Carvajal and Grealish are really getting into it. There's a little bit of fouling and biting and and things like that and it's fun it's it's got an intense match and to be fair to create a narrative out of this game there's not much going on it's a lot of tactical a lot of control um real sitting deep in control of the game not making sure to keep city at harm's at arm's length um alaba and rudiger are really on top of holland not staying in front and behind them all the time so there's a lot of space for the midfield to really get in but Real Madrid are keeping it very tight keeping it very tight not letting City get much penetration and when City play with Bernardo Silva it's for control because he's not a he's not a creative player there are two types of player that City play with they play with this concept of the pausa which are these players that are outlet balls that'll slow the game down and control tempo and they play with attacking players who get in behind and attack so De Bruyne are the attackers Holland is a is a forward thinker uh Mares is a forward thinker uh, Foden is a forward thinker these are players that want to go up and down and attack whereas Bernardo Grealish Gundogan these are your players that slow games down they won't go forward they'll turn and make that turn they're the players that you want them to make that pass but they tend to keep things settled ticking the ball over, making the next pass, in control of the game. Grealish will get a ball. He'll go on a little run. He'll turn around. He'll get fouled. Now, does he create stuff? Absolutely. It's not that he doesn't create things. It's just that their role in the team is to control tempo because with tempo, you control a game. And what Guardiola wanted to do more than anything in this game was control it and not be in a track meet with the two most clinical players in all of Europe in Benzema and Vinny, reducing the chances they could to hurt City. But in the second half, City were a bit frantic. They didn't get as much control. And you had mostly in the second half, many, many shots by Real. Vinny Jr. had a shot. Rodrigo, Tony Cruz, Valverde, Benzema on 65. So Benzema, that whole crew gets in, in control. And City are on the back foot through the middle of the second half. Cometh the moment, cometh the man. Um, on a turnover by Grealish into Gundogan, who lays it off to De Bruyne. He fires it in, and he flies through the air, both feet off the ground, top bins, beautiful from De Bruyne, and it meant everything to him. Uh, he was not having a great game, but you know, like I said, this game was very tactical, very controlled, and he put his hands to his face as though he were tearing up, and I can see why it's happening. Kevin De Bruyne is now in year, you know, he's in his 10th year as a professional, maybe 15 as a kid, and he hasn't won this Champions League. And I think he knows that his time with Belgium is probably in its past, uh, in that they're, they're, they're not going to win. They're golden generations who will do nothing. And this Champions League is his moment to win. And I think he felt all the pressure of that moment uh, to score and get it done. But after the goal, nothing much happens. Uh, both teams seem to go, okay, there's a goal. Let's, uh, let's let it slide off. We do get the one ranged shot from Tuka Meni, uh, another shot from Benzema that on a header that was sort of dangerous, but uh, things were okay, were okay. There was a high value shot that I believe that that um, that um Ederson did make a couple saves that were important. I, it's the Benzema header that he definitely gets a hold of on the cross by Tony Cruz that I do recall, but there's not really many high value shots to write home about aside from that one there was another one i think on the break there was a cross that was cut out by diaz in the first half that was dangerous there were moments and every time real came forward they were dangerous and petrified me but this game was more tactical more controlled what city wanted they take the point they didn't play extra players they take the nerves out and they go on to the next game and i don't think about it but from a feeling perspective it was a difficult game to watch because I wasn't used to City not being in control and the threats that Real Madrid have are very real and very, very dangerous. 
Uh, City, as we segue a little bit into the Premier League, we'll just touch on it, do play Everton at Goodison. And you would expect that all the front three will be replaced. It'll be Mares, it'll be Alvarez, and it will be Foden probably playing up front. We might see Phillips just to spell De Bruyne, or maybe Bernardo will drop into the midfield. And then I would expect Laporte to come back in. Akenji hasn't missed a game. And then um, John Stone seems to be uh, favored at all times. It'll be a bit more, uh, I, I would expect Kyle Walker not to play uh, because he's not needed. He was great. Outstanding players in this game, John Stones and Kyle Walker. They relatively kept Vinny, Vinicius Jr. quiet, uh, really controlled things. And then Diaz with the block. And Ederson, who I give a hard time to, did come through with a big save. But we go on Champions League. Um, we go on to the Milan Derby, which didn't disappoint from a spectacle perspective in that it's two of the biggest teams in Europe, but did disappoint from AC Milan's perspective. They were all over the shop in the first 15 minutes and really got beat badly. And it could have been worse, frankly. Uh, Jekyll on an amazing cross-body uh, side foot volley on a cross from a corner, puts it in on eight. And then Mkhitaryan just breaks through and fires in on goal. And there were three other chances. This game was not close. Uh, AC Milan were terrible. They scored on their first two shots on goal. And then on 16, Mkhitaryan had another great shot and Inter were just completely dominant through the first 40 minutes. Um, Milan did have chances. Giroud had a couple blocked on 43 and a couple more, but then the second half was a bit more bitty. Um, Jekko had another incredible chance set up from Bastoni that he didn't put through a 50% chance. I mean, that is about as big a chance as you can get, uh, did not score. And it doesn't look like these teams will be a challenge for Real or City, but it is football. Anything can happen. But when you think about Edin Dzeko, who's 37, uh, and and Mkhitaryan, who's basically a Premier League reject. You've got Matteo Diamond in this team, a Manchester United reject. There's a lot of there's a lot of you know non internationals. This is Hakan Chakanaglu, who's been there for what feels like 15 years <laughs> at at Inter. You know, it just not much going on in terms of high level players and high level quality. Um, you know, Ben Asair, of course, is a name, but and Leal didn't play. So uh, not a lot to write home about for uh, AC Milan, but they have it all to do. They've got a lot of work to do, and that's where they are in this Champions League. And whoever wins between this Milan derby will have a really, really difficult time getting through and going forward into these games. Um, Champions League gets more and more and more difficult as you go through it, but uh, that's Europe. I do want to touch on a couple of things. Um, West Ham, congrats. You won your first leg in the Conference League and um, I believe Roma in the Europa League. I don't even know who's in the Europa League. Whatever. Leverkusen versus Roma, Jose Mourinho. Europa League, we'll figure out at the final. I'm not going to go too far into it, but I did want to touch on West Ham did get their win today against Azed Alkmaar. A um, couple goals there from uh, Saeed Benrama and one from um, um, Mikel Antonio. So good stuff for them. The Champions League games resume on Tuesday for Inter and Milan and Wednesday the 17th for Manchester and Real at the Etihad. This is Main Road but the Etihad is the other picture. Um, so let us transition, transition, transition to the Premier League. But let's get our standing. Let's see where we are. Uh, we did have Monday games. Just want to touch on them again. Those were all those relegation battles with Leicester at losing to Fulham, Everton with their massive result against Brighton, and Nottingham Forest with their massive re result against Southampton. So we reset. The battles are really for two, three things, really. I do have to give credit to Arsenal. They did win their game against Newcastle. They do place pressure on Manchester City. They do are only one point behind. City have a game in hand, but have to go to um St. James, do have to go to Goodison to play on Sunday 
in a very hostile environment. So nothing is solved. Nothing is done. Arsenal will host Brighton, which is, let's just start with that. With Let's just start with the, um, with the champions race, with the, the, the Premier League title, excuse me. Arsenal have Brighton, City have Everton. Um, Arsenal have to win all their games to even finish four points behind City. That means City have a game and a draw to play with. Uh, I'm sure they'd rather not play with them. City have an extra game to play. They do have to play Brighton in the middle here. So Brighton is going to figure in everything. They have been slowing down despite the fact that they got, um, they got, they played earlier in the week and lost to Everton 5-1. The XG was different, but it wasn't real. Uh, Bright, Brighton still created a lot and created many chances and Everton and Arsenal will have a hard time with Brighton, uh, but um, I'd expect them to win. I believe that um, the last game was won by, let me just make sure, let me just make sure here. Yep, the last game was won by Arsenal 4-2 at the Amex. So we'll see. But then prior to that, um, Brighton had beat Arsenal both in the EFL Cup and in the Premier League last season under Potter. So uh, Arsenal did have a good game against them earlier in the season on the reverse fixture, but now Brighton who are a great away side will play Arsenal who have their own injuries to deal with. I believe Zinchenko's out. Saliba is not coming back. Either, neither of them are coming back uh, this season. Zinchenko's hurt. Um, Brighton are one of the best teams away in the league. They are fourth in the table in away points. So, a very, very good season for them. Arsenal, actually the best away team in the league, but they are playing at home. They are third in the table in home points. So good for them. Um, but Arsenal, I want to see more. I want to see more. I want to see you play. Um, Brighton are going to let you play. So I want to see from Saka. I want to see from Martinelli. I want to see you guys do damage to the side. And then on the on the Everton versus City front, big, big game. Normally, you wouldn't expect this. This is a bottom-of-the-table team versus, um, versus top-of-the-tee, top-of-the-league, best team in the world. But the circumstances and the context of which City are playing Everton are make this an interesting game. Everton at home, coming off an amazing result. City having just spent the most mental energy you could probably spend in a game coming off the Bernabeu on Wednesday, on Tuesday, now have to play at Goodison, a place where they have not played well historically. Uh, I could see City having a really, really hard time and maybe a draw. I'm not being funny. I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not being hedgy. A draw in this game would be okay. A draw would be okay for City because uh, then they would just go, okay, we got our draw. Let's keep going. But uh, super, super duper tough game for City to have to play in the middle of that uh, run against uh, Real Madrid. And I am frankly worried. Is it all right if I'm worried? Because I'm fucking worried for sure. I'm very, very worried. <laughs> um, yeah, very worried. <laughs> I'm going to go through a couple of other games, especially in the relegation battle. Um, Leicester versus Liverpool. Leicester host Liverpool at the King Power. Leicester, after the last game, it was just another awful performance, losing 5-3. It could have been worse, as they say. And Fulham had no players. I mean, it was Willian's cross. It was all this stuff. They were awful. They still can't defend. They still can't stop in the midfield. No Ndidi means they don't prevent anything from getting to their back four. And it's just going to be another very, very difficult game for Leicester to feel like they can get a result. Liverpool have been playing much better of late, especially at home. They're actually getting clean sheets now. They actually are on six wins on the bounce. I remember I counted it online live, <laughs> which makes for great uh, podcasting when you count numbers. Two clean sheets in a row, one against Fulham, one against Brentford, both at home. Uh, I would say the Brentford performance was much better. They got that lucky win against Tottenham where they probably should have drawn. Um, they had, I mean, listen, come on. 
it is Tottenham and they are bad, but you know, they gave up a, a decent amount of XG. Uh, the other games you'd feel good about, they did legitimately beat uh, West Ham and Nottingham Forest before that, but uh, it's that home cooking. They've had four of their last five at home, which really makes a difference. And then two of their next three will be away from home. So their last three games are Leicester, Aston Villa, and Southampton. They have a chance at the top four because United have slipped tremendously. Uh, Klopp making the changes at the right time. Player of the season, Mr. Allison, plus 10, plus nine goals and expected goals. That's a tremendous amount. And I always said that Allison was great, but he really is that good. He's fantastic. He carries the team uh, a long way, makes up for a lot of defensive mistakes, especially we have the slip of Van Dyke. He's not bad. He's just not as unbelievable as he was throughout most of his career. But I think the big thing here is is the transformation of Alexander Arnold moving into the midfield, getting assists in five games in a row, just completely changed the way things are going, getting some consistency with Gakbo now playing regularly. Nunez will just have to take time to bet in. You've got Gakbo, you've got Diego Jota, you've now got Diaz back. The midfield solidifying because the attack is solidifying. The more bodies, the more running, the more pressing, the better Liverpool's defense is, the better their pressing is. So uh, as their press gets better because they have more bodies, then their defense can improve because they have less time to deal with runners in behind and less time for passes to get picked out. So Liverpool playing well uh, away from home is a different gravy to home. Uh, Leicester do pack an attack. They still do create chances. James, you know, James Madison is on 10 and 9. That's very, very good for any kind of creative player. Harvey Barnes with 12 goals. And we've got our friend, Mr. Vardy, starting to play, starting to fight. If they're going to win, it's going to be because of their old boys. Iverson was terrible. Again, he missed a goal. So, you know, one of the things I think about with Leicester, why they're so bad, even though they can attack, they've got bad goalkeeping. You really notice bad goalkeeping when you don't have a good goalkeeper <laughs> and Leicester's uh, two-headed monster uh, just did not help them at all, all season. Uh, and Liverpool should have an easy go against Leicester, but Leicester are fighting for their lives. If they don't win this game, they're really, really, really in trouble and they don't have an easy run. Uh, Leicester's remaining games are, let us get to the scores and fixtures of the great and powerful Leicester City. Uh, their remaining games are Liverpool, Newcastle, West Ham, away at Newcastle. Uh, their one game that maybe they can win is home against West Ham. Uh, they're away at Newcastle. They just can't buy wins anywhere. I think that Leeds game was damaging. The draw against Everton, damaging. Those are the teams they needed to beat because they're better than them. Better than those two teams. They should have beat Leeds and Everton. But being the weak team that they are, they couldn't handle it. Uh, Ward and Iverson are just crap goalkeepers, barely saving 65% of shots, unable to keep clean sheets, just both really bad uh, and hurting their team and their chances to stave off relegation. Okay, more relegation banter. Um, Leeds playing at home against Newcastle. Big Sam going against one of his uh, clubs. I watched City and Leeds play. Um, there's some thought that, you know, Leeds were okay versus City. I would dispute that. Just because they didn't give up five doesn't mean they were good. Um, they were not good. Uh, they got lucky uh, in that they City inexplicably gave up a goal, but they were poor. <laughs> uh, they did try and stay narrow and stay deep, so they did get a reprieve in that regard. They did freaking finally bench Medlier, who was a minus 12. I mean, 12 goal difference. I mean, bad teams have bad XG, but minus 12 for a keeper is just, just untenable. You can't play that guy. Uh, so there's that. And they have a shot, I suppose, at home against Newcastle. 
They had a nil-nil draw against Newcastle earlier in the season, and Newcastle are coming off a relatively tough loss where they played okay versus Arsenal, but uh, I, anything but a win here would be shocking. Newcastle do need to get points. They're not quite nailed on for the top four, but they're getting very, very, very close. Um, Newcastle sitting in third still um, and looking very likely to finish in the top four, just getting the final points here. They sit on 65 with United on 63 and Liverpool on 62. Every loss hurts. They had only lost two of their last 10, but those two happen to be two games that Liverpool won. So Liverpool closing the gap on them. They're still much stronger. They're still pretty strong and they're on for a great season. You know, they still should finish in the top four. I expect them to. They're better than United, um, but they've got to get these wins. Putting a, a, a lead side out of its misery will help, but um, they need to get the wins just to solidify that top four spot. Only three spots left, only three games left. Liverpool chasing down the pack, trying to get those coveted Champions League spots. Leeds playing Newcastle for their lives with Big Sam trying to find anything at this point um, will be very, very, very difficult. Uh, in the who wants to play in the Conference League Cup, Aston Villa host Tottenham Hotspur, who have slept, who have slinked down like a stone. The Harry Kane team just has to keep relying on Harry Kane to do anything. He's now resorting to assisting to himself. Uh, they don't really have a coach. I don't trust Ryan Mason. Sure, there's a little bit of vibes going. It feels very ole. He should not get the job. Please do not give Ryan Mason the job. They have one. They have two wins in their last eight um, uh, against Brighton, which was inexplicable because they should have lost, and against Crystal Palace, which is about as dull as you could watch a game uh, in the season. But they have Villa, Brentford, and Leeds. Um, this Villa game is big for them. Uh, a win will solidify Europe for them, very likely. Either Europa or Conference looking more and more like the Conference League. But uh, Aston Villa to get into Europe will be huge. Unai Emery's run has ended. Uh, the Ollie Watkins scoring a goal every day has ended. Um, you know, Aston Villa have played 35, same as Tottenham. And then you have Brighton in between there, but with two games in hand. But they have Arsenal this week. So cool game. Looking forward to it. Uh, but I'd expect Villa to win this game, especially at home. Especially Unai Emery's going to outcoach uh, Ryan Mason until the cows come home. Now, more relegation friends. Nottingham Forest away against Chelsea. Chelsea getting their win finally against Bournemouth. They are staying up. <laughs> uh, and Fat Frank does not have to feel shitty about his life anymore. He can just go, oh, well, I just fucked up. But anyway, uh, Forrest coming off that huge win against Southampton, they'll be aiming for a draw. They're sitting on 33. A win will definitely make them safe. But um, away from home, Forrest are just abominable. And if Frank Lampard loses to Forrest at Stamford Bridge, he should be fired. He should have been fired last week. But uh, that'll be what they work on there. Uh, looking forward there, not much. A lot of Steve Cooper. Is he a better coach than Frank Lampard? You bet your asses that he is. Uh, Nottingham Forest will try and sit deep and frustrate Chelsea and hit Chelsea on the break. Uh, you'd expect them to do that. And maybe Chelsea will start playing the kids. They have nothing to play for. They're safe. Nothing. So uh, I would expect Forrest to show force and push Chelsea back. If they get an early goal there, then Chelsea should be in trouble. Um, the Roy experience, uh, we move on to Crystal Palace versus Bournemouth. Uh, Crystal Palace are safe, sitting right on 40. They are the classic middle-of-the-table team. They've been about as middle-of-the-table as the middle-of-the-table can be. Uh, and then this is a battle with Bournemouth, who are sitting on the same amount of points as they are a one point behind on 39. Uh, the quality of Palace is much better. They've got to feel shitty about that weird West Ham game. I mean, uh, Spurs game. But Roy's team is, yeah, after winning a bunch of games, they've now slowed down just a little bit. 
losing to Tottenham and losing to Wolves, sandwiching their win against West Ham that got us all worried about West Ham. But uh, we'll see where they are um, after this one. Um, Gary O'Neill got his boys in good shape. 39 will take them home. If they get a win and can match Chelsea, that would be incredible for Bournemouth. It would be an amazing result, but uh, less uh, about where they need to go. Uh, another game, Southampton Fulham. If Southampton lose this game, they are officially relegated. They must win this game. So Southampton holds Fulham. They're done. I liked Sellis, but I don't think that's going to happen. And then finally, the last game on Saturday, Manchester United versus Wolves. These are the games that United needs to win. They're very, very good against the crap of the league. And so I would expect Manchester United to pull this one out versus Leeds and then really solidify their top four place. They are on a two game losing streak. Um, big, big, massive losses. The Brighton one probably hurts the most because it was the last second. Um, but the West Ham loss also just not able to create anything, not finding the goals they need to find. Um, the draw against Tottenham probably hurt. And then I think, you know, after the Sevilla outing, that really hurt. They've got to get back to that middle period of the season when they really were kicking on, just sorting uh, the Premier League standings here when they really were winning there. Yeah, in the middle of November, just after the World Cup, all the way through to to February, they were really doing well. The Liverpool 7-0 really damaged them. They took a dip there, uh, then drew against Southampton nil-nil inexplicably, uh, then lose to Newcastle away. Then their home cooking does well for them, beating Everton, Brentford, and Nottingham Forest. But these last two games have been a real blip again after the injuries uh, they suffered. They need to find a way to get themselves back off the schneid. Been very good about um, reacting to losses and getting wins when they need to. But as I said in a video that I might share later, if United lose this top four spot this season, it will be a catastrophe. They've got to hold down to this spot. They have an opportunity to get into the top four on a, with a team that's not that good, frankly. Um, it's not as good as it should be. Everything underneath it says they should be better. But the nice thing is they have four games. They have Wolves, Bournemouth, Chelsea, and Fulham. Four games that they should win. Um, but you would have said they would have beaten West Ham and they didn't. So they just have, and three of them are at home. So the schedule is very, very favorable for United to stay in the top four, but they've got to find a way to score goals and they've got to keep mistakes down and not have De Gea throw games away like he did against West Ham. Two points, the draw against Brighton and a draw against West Ham would have made them totally safe uh, and really had uh, the upper hand on Liverpool but now they're in trouble. And if Liverpool catch them, it will be a crushing blow to lose the top four spot that they've been holding on to for so much of the season. As much as Liverpool were just like, well, we're just going to play. We're just going to win and keep going. Liverpool, Manchester United have handed it back to them, dropping the two games in a row while Liverpool are on a run. That's six points made up in a week. So a massive, massive, massive game for. Um, for United Wolves do not score either. So a draw wouldn't be good enough. They need to win this game, find a way to get Rashford back scoring, get Ericsson and Fernandez playing with Casemiro. Everything should be fine. They've just got to finish their chances. And I think frankly, they play better with Veg horse. It sort of frees up Fernandez and, um, and, and Rashford to score. I mean, I know he doesn't score, but he does things they need him to do. Whereas Martial might be a better finisher, but He's just such a miserable player. It's difficult to see what he's supposed to be doing. Um, one more game, uh, West Ham versus Brentford, both teams on the beach. Uh, West Ham doing that Thursday, Sunday thing, just winning their conference league game against Azad Alkmaar. Um, they will, they don't need to win this game. They're probably safe. They're four points ahead of Nottingham Forest, but another couple points, another win would feel great, especially if they got to the magic number of 40 and Brentford their season's really over they're sitting 
comfortably mid table on 50 less to play for really just playing out the string at this point, trying to reach some goals, get Ivan, Tony, more goals, things like that. They're in good shape. The season's getting very, very, very close to the, to the, to the end of the season. Only three match weeks left. Uh, some teams only have three games left. Uh, some have four, some have five. Brighton specifically has five. Got to play Manchester City uh, on two weeks from now on Wednesday. Uh, let me just check here on my final notes for the show. Just little things that are going on. I do want to bring up a um, couple of things. That Dyche uh, Everton thing that's happening. They're all of a sudden scoring goals. It makes me very nervous for that City game that's coming up if I didn't cover it enough. Freaking me out. Uh, then we've got another thing. Sergio Busquets of, Man- of, of Barcelona finally going to be leaving Barcelona. He has the second most trophies of any player. I believe it's 34 in 18 seasons. <laughs> that's a lot of trophies. Uh, you know, integral to the... Barcelona, Pep's Barcelona. He's the last player left from the 2011 team. Um, and that will be the end of that era. 12 years later, he's the final piece left of Pep's super midfield of Xavi, um, Iniesta, and uh, Busquets. Legendary team winning everything, including the World Cup, including the Euros. Just an incredible career for Sergio Busquets. Looking like MLS, I don't see why he would do that. I'd love to see him in the Premier League in a middle middle of the table team, just showing the world what what he can do, just in terms of popping the ball around. At this point, he's more Jorginho than Rodri, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, you know, he still can he still can make a touch, put a ball around a corner, and play a player in, and just controlling that bausa, that tempo of a game. So respect to Sergio Busquets in his last few weeks of the season we're getting very very close to the end okay that was the squeaky bum time podcast with laurent cortines we are the football wing of the chop sports channel and presented exclusively by the premier streaming network we record on mondays and thursdays show be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode and if you're listening on apple please rate and review the show as it means everything to us thank you and good night